G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie-David, and what I love doing is bringing guests in who are experts in their field. If you're a regular listener, you'll know that we get some awesome guests in here. Uh, and by the people that have liked, subscribed, shared what we're doing as well, we're able to get in even uh, even some, some wonderful names. And today's guest, yeah, we're in for a real treat because if you've been on YouTube, uh, if you've seen what's going on in the, in the buyer's energy space, you'll be familiar with a guy named Ravi Sharma. G'day to the show. Okay, welcome on. Thanks, mate. Thanks for having me on. Mate, I appreciate it. We're going to get into your story in a second. But before we kick off, I want to just reiterate that this uh, chat is going to be general in nature and not intended to give advice. So if you do need advice, please seek out a professional, mate. Now that we've got that out the way, how you doing? <laughs> I'm really well. I'm really well. Yeah? Thanks for having me, man. Not at all, mate. Thanks. I've... Uh, I admired what you're doing and I'll get to kind of your presence and what you're doing in a second, but uh, we're having a chat before, mate. You're looking nice and tanned. You come back from a, a holiday in Thailand. Yes, Thailand. It, yeah. was, uh, it was a couple of weeks there and I realised very quickly that yeah. this idea of living on a beach and just relaxing, <laughs> it's good for a couple of days. And then yes. after that, you're like, I need to build something. I need to do something. Yeah. And um, yeah, no, it was good. It was a good break, but now I'm back. Awesome. Yeah, I mean, that, that notion that you, you make your money and go live on a beach, mate, it's a... Uh, it doesn't last very long, especially if you're, you're wired that way to, you know, keep creating, keep pushing, keep helping. For example, there's, it's wasted talent almost, you know, pulling up stumps and, and going somewhere like, I don't know, not that Thailand's wasted, but you got so much to offer. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's largely driven by people's motivation. So like, let's say for instance, you're just working for money, then you're mm. ultimately looking just to go, okay, I want to go to the beach and just relax. And yeah. I thought very early on, that's what I wanted. Yeah. Um, but then when you find something that you're passionate about and it actually helps people, I think then you're going, I'm creating like a loop here that's just forever. Yeah. So that's how I feel. I think you're the same, right? Um, absolutely. You, you really find that enjoyment. It's the words flow for me. So when you're in flow, um, you don't feel like it's a hard day's work. You go, hey, man, at the end of the day, I've like, I feel like a mission accomplished. Had some great chats, helped some people. The energy is still there, for example. Where those days you walk out, you're like, I feel drained of energy. You know that you've been really out of flow. Yeah, yeah. for sure, for sure. Awesome. So I like to kick off going the, the three Ps, a little bit about yourself personally, professionally, and your property journey. Nice, you know, I like it. I have seen your journey. So for those that are listening and maybe a little bit unfamiliar, yep. uh, share us a little bit about your, the Ravi Sharma story. Yeah, so I think um, I've probably had a very diverse 20s. Um, right. So I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, mm. Although in my year six, you know, you got your farewell book or whatever <laughs> it was. I literally wrote there and I looked through it because I didn't believe it at the time. But, yeah. um, I wrote real estate agent. Wow. And so for some reason I would have gravitated towards that. But Hang on, you're wearing socks, mate. You wouldn't have made it as a real estate agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a different um, different attire, so I wouldn't yeah. have fit in. Uh, but that was the whole goal at that time. Yeah. I mean, you're in year six, so you don't know anything. Yeah. Um, and then, But something was there. It was There was something yeah. there. I'm not sure what it was, but um, there was obviously some seed that was planted. Mm. Uh, but then, yeah, throughout my 20s, I've done like so many different roles. Um, you know, spent some time also becoming a DJ, which took off and then was doing awesome. international gigs, which was fun. Fun. Uh, but then how I could you change from <laughs> DJ to anything else? Now? You're living the dream. Uh, you know what it was? I realized there was a point there and I was at a gig and I said, do I really want to be like staying up all night, have no sort of um, routine? Mm. Cause I really loved that routine that I had like a morning routine, just yeah. having family around. And we, um, you know, sort of touch base on that before that yeah. it was so important for me. So if I was traveling and doing those things, I couldn't have that home base. Yeah. And so it's a lifestyle you got to go all in on, isn't correct, it? Like correct. You, I think you've got to be able to say to your family, I'm on this plane, see you later. I'm chasing this dream of, you know, be on the deck, be on the wheels of steel and uh, <laughs> spin some tunes. And it's like, I don't know, it's a, it's a party lifestyle, which I don't, I'm not sure how long, how long, what longevity there would be in a, in a career. 100%. Like that. Yeah. And for anyone that knows me, I'm like non drinker, no smoker. <laughs> like I don't do drugs and I've never done it. So for me, I was like the complete opposite of someone going into that field. Um, I just really enjoyed it for the time I was there and, you know, I was good at it. So yeah. I did that for a while and then I nice. realized that I wanted to make that shift. And, you know, the pandemic helped um, in making that decision easier to mm -hmm. come across into the buyer's agency space. Yeah, nice. So that. That transition to the buyer's agency space, how does how does that penny drop for you then? Yeah, so I think I realized that I wanted to do something where I could help people because yeah. obviously I was building my portfolio the whole time. So I knew that, yes, I could do this day in, day out, but the reality was I wanted to build the machine. Mm -hmm. So while I was building the machine, I had you know family, friends, and they started coming up and they're like, oh, what should I do? What should I do? And that's sort of where I started putting two and two together that 
I think this is my calling where yeah, I can get okay. the maximum benefit personally, but also bring the most impact in the community and amongst friends and family. Yeah. So a year or two, so in like probably 2019, uh, early in 2019, I decided go do my real estate course and whatnot. Yeah. So the pandemic, all it did was accelerate the plan mm -hmm. um, because I still had bookings and whatnot, but I decided obviously there's no gigs anymore. I'm going to shift across and make that jump now. Yeah. Uh, so leaving school, I just want to go back a little bit. Yeah, yeah. You're, a young, you're a young dude. Um, was there uni? What did you? What, did, what was the leap afterwards? Yeah, so did uni straight out of high school. Okay. Um, and you know, I did like a business course at UTS. Yeah, did some marketing there, and then okay. got a grad position in like Mars Chocolate. So nice one. I was cheering. You know, hey, things were good, exceptionally well. Yeah. yeah. And uh, and then while I was there, I realized that maybe I don't want to get told what to do. Yeah. Um, and you got, a, you got a problem with authority. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. And I was like, oh, that means oh. you need to be self-employed. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, yeah, from there, I was like, I need the quickest way out. Um, but I also want something where it's in the property space. And at yeah. the time I didn't know what buyer's agents were. Um, I only knew what a real estate agent was yeah. and I didn't really want to go down that path because uh, okay. I was like, I don't know how much I could bring um, to the table and help people. So I ended up doing conveyancing for like three and a three years. Yeah, um, right. So I did my course, got my license and all that. And then I got just so bored. Um, and so I decided, okay, now I'll go do the DJing stuff. Yeah. And you got too much personality to be a conveyancer. <laughs> I, I say that with love. I, I love conveyances, but they're like, uh, they're the ultimate risk officers, right? Like everything's just like, don't do that, don't do that. Yep. And so it was, it was cross the T's, dot the I's. Yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, it was just not the environment that I wanted to be around. So mm. yeah, made the shift across. I even did like a, a broker course and did, yeah. you got my license and all of that and figured that that may have not been the right option mm. for me. And the buyer's agency just naturally sort of, that was the natural pivot. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, one of the other ones to talk about is, is Pease's property. Now yeah. you said you bought your first property at 21. Yes. Mate, I was, instead of being the DJ, I was down there listening to the DJ at 21. <laughs> I don't think I had any money uh, to, to scratch a dollar together to buy a property. Uh, how did you afford to buy your first property at 21, mate? Yeah, I think it was all throughout um, high school. I knew that I wanted to buy real estate. Yeah. I knew I needed to get assets. So that much I had realized, um, which was good and a lot further ahead Where than my Where does that influence mates. come from as a young guy though? Um, so my dad was into real estate, so okay. he was investing. Uh, he wasn't, you know, he wasn't building a massive portfolio or anything like that, but I saw, you know, how well they had done in real estate. Yeah. And so I sort of went, okay, that seems like a way to exit. And mm. I think the the moment that hit me the most was my brother and I, we went to this seminar at the time. I yeah. have no idea who hosted it. I don't even know if they're around, but I walked into this room and it was like a couple of old guys with suits on and mm. they tried to sell us some stuff at the end. But what they said was 10 properties in 10 years and you retire. And I was like, I get this in 20. So by the time I'm 30, I, I'm finished, I'm done. Mm. And so I don't need to do all the struggles that, you know, everyone else in my family were going through. I could get out. Yeah. And so that's where it sort of shifted most. Awesome. I mean, to connect the dots at such a young age, I don't know, there's there's something there. Uh, are you a smart guy? Did you, well, like, did you do well academically? I'm going to be <laughs> I, Yeah, I do well, I do well. Yeah, so there's a, there's a level of IQ there. I'm sensing there's a level of EQ here because you, you're obviously great with clients. There's some empathy here and, and, and great rapport building as well. I guess to connect the dots – uh, I'm not blowing any smoke, mate. I'm, I'm saying it's, it's a real sweet spot. <laughs> I it's a real it, sweet spot, and uh, it's something that I admire. I think the, uh, yeah, the, the, the when we talk about the industry, you know, who rises to the top, yeah. they've got that level of IQ, EQ. Uh, it's a really good mix as well. But the other part to me is the example that your dad set, and I think this is where, and I think I've had to do a lot of soul searching as, as a you know, young kids, but even as a parent, going, what am I projecting to my kids that's going to put them in a in a good headspace. So if I say, I don't know, they're far too young to, to understand it, but rent money's dead money or money doesn't grow on trees or, you know, yes, you can have that or we can't afford it. It's, just, it's all these little nuances where it's, you're feeding them these money ideas, behaviors, mindset. Whereas if you're setting a really good example as a parent going, you can build wealth, you can do this, you can buy property really well. For example, mistakes will happen, but it's how you deal with it. 
that's going to set the tone for, I guess, how your kids are going to grow up as well, right? 100%. Like I'm not a father yet, but, yeah. you know, I, I've sort of thought about how would I approach it? And I'm, I'm assuming you throw all that out the window when you get there. But Mate, you, uh, just, you just keep saying, no, don't do that. <laughs> Sit down. Uh, I'll wait for time. Like, they can understand me. <laughs> um, um, but I, yeah. I totally agree. I think there's certain things that we do subconsciously because our parents had done it to us as well. And mm. I think the saving part, migrant mentality, right? Yeah. That was them, you know, don't go and spend it on certain things. And, you know, when we went on family holidays, it was like local. It was Correct. like this one motel, all of us slept in the same room. And mm. I sort of remembered that to go, okay, well, when I have money, I need to go and be smart with it. Yeah. And I think in later in my twenties, I started realizing that, okay, there's smarter ways to do this and I don't need to take as much, you know, um, in terms of like savings and I can enjoy yeah. my twenties cause I'll never get them back. Yeah. Um, so that's why I advocate like on the channel as well. Like you can enjoy, you know, your twenties and your thirties and still do well financially. Yeah. Which is a, which is an interesting dilemma as a 20 something year old, right? I, I speak to a lot of 20 somethings who have, the risk because you've got time up on, on your side, but they don't have the means, i.e., you know, low deposits, lower borrowing capacity because, you know, they come out of uni maybe as well. And then as you get on in life, and let's say you meet someone in their late 40s, 50s, for example, they've got the means and the ability, but they've got less risk because there's more to lose. And it's a funny shift, isn't it, over time? It's like, man, you've got the ability to go and buy three or four more investment properties. Like, oh, I don't know. It's just, yep. it's too much of a risk. Whereas at a young, a young person is like, I'm chomping at the bit to go and buy more properties <laughs> and they don't, have that, they don't have that ability available to them as well. Yeah, like, and you're so right. Like the system is quite flawed in how we've been designed, right? You are the most healthiest and you've got all the time in the world, but you don't have any of the resources to mm. go and enjoy life at that level. And then later on in life when you're not so young and you're not as, you know, uh, you can't move as freely, you have all the money in the world, but you can't do anything. Plus you're probably in the mindset of like, I'm cool. I don't want to travel and I don't want to do those things. Yeah. So that's where I think... You know, over the last six to 12 months, I started realizing health was so important totally. that the more you invest now, it just makes like hard work today makes life easier tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so imagine if you can extend out the the good years, you know, the five, 10, 15 years of being able to travel. Now you've got the resources, you get best of all worlds. Your kids are probably old enough to yeah. take care of themselves and um, you look like you're in shape, mate. Oh. So uh, <laughs> I, I know you advocate for that too. <laughs> oh, look, I think it's... Uh, yeah, you, you, we, we know health is wealth. The last few years has taught us that as well. Um, I just think it's one health to me, whether it's training, whatever you're, you're doing from a health perspective, there's no shortcuts. You yeah. can't buy your way out of it. You can't, there's no silver bullet. There's no magic potion, for example. It's showing up. It's the way that you eat. It's the way that you sleep. It's the way that you mindset. Uh, that That's what I love about the health and fitness component, which is I don't care what you're doing. You, you've got mates that do jiu-jitsu or they're doing triathlons or whatever they're doing or just running in general it's like they're doing something and they're, they're putting their body first because if that falls into place then most other parts of your, your life then kind of click into place as well and i think financially it has very similar very uh, similar parallels which is there are no shortcuts correct you've had it's to make discipline. a good decision the good decision leads to the next decision leads yep. to the next decision as well so take me through like you've Gone from one property at 21, we're talking 10 years later, you're 31. How's that journey been 10 years on in property? It's been great, man. Um, obviously, there was times that came up where property wasn't doing so well. You had APRA come in as well mm. and, um, you know, 2017, 2018 wasn't so great. And then you've got 2020 where everyone thought everything's going to go down, but it went the opposite way. Yeah. So there's always going to be ebbs and flows. And for me, in my mind, I was like, whenever I have the opportunity to borrow, I will borrow and I will go and buy something. And that was my rule that I set out yeah. to myself that I'm, at, I'm available, I can do this at 21. I don't know if the banks change their rules. I was always fearful of that. And so as soon as I got the opportunity, my broker hated me at the time. I was like <laughs> always asking him like, what about now? Like has things changed? <laughs> and I was in that men mentality that I don't care what prices are doing. All I know is that I need to have assets and I'll acquire them and I've got time. So even if I saw a 20% correction, worst case scenario, mm. I'll still survive, but I've got the asset now. And so if the banks change their rules, okay, what happens if they come out in 10 years or five years, they say maximum, you know, properties you can have is two. Well, mm -hmm. then what do you do? You've, the time's gone, right? And they probably grandfather the rule that whoever's yeah. got the assets are done. And that's the mentality that I approach it with. And that's why I think I've moved a lot faster than, you know, some of the people around me. Yeah. People around you becomes a big thing. You just, uh, something I wanted to ask you about, which is a, you mentioned a broker very early on and, 
um, how did you how did you start buying your first property and, and, and acquiring this one? Did you use a buyer's agent yourself and, and how did you build your team? Yeah, so looking back, I mean, it would have been great to use a buyer's agent just leveraging what they had learned. Yeah. It's the reason you, you know, hire experts in any field because totally. you can leverage what they've already learned. But I think for me on that one, you know, I didn't know, they weren't as popular as they are now. Great. And so I didn't do that. But now hindsight's great. I mean, you would have had something that probably performed a little bit better in a different location. Um, so I've gone through the period of trying trying to figure it out myself, doing the research and then making the mistakes. Yeah. Um, but if I had my ch- turn again, and yeah. again, I wouldn't change really anything, but I think I can see the benefit of having support, uh, whether that's the right accountants, you know, the right mortgage mm-hmm. brokers giving you the right advice. And um, yeah, just having that right team around you can, can be the difference between you, you know, absolutely killing it in seven to 10 years or doing okay, mm-hmm. you know, in seven to 10 years. The peer group becomes another one. So you got your team of professionals, which is one part, and you yep. go, they're all they're all kind of vested in my success. But then you get a peer group, and I guess at 20, 20, going through your twenties, for example, it would seem, and I guess it's a bit more on vogue now. But going back a while, it's like, hey man, what are you doing? You're buying properties, and I don't think that's a good time to buy, and it's, <laughs> that sounds too expensive, and um, you should wait to then you know buy something superior. How do you shut out the noise? How do you, or did you have a really good peer support group around you that was not detractors, but advocates? Yeah, really good topic because when I decided to buy that first property, it was in regional New South Wales. Yeah. And where uh, are we talking, by the way, if you don't mind me asking? So uh, up in the north, mid, mid north coast. Okay. Right. And yeah. um, oh, it's a great location. Great yeah. location. Um, and but when you're in Sydney, you're like, oh, that's a, exactly. That's a <laughs> exactly. And so when I went to my mates, I said, hey, look, guys, you know, I bought an investment property. And they said, where? <laughs> Let's go see it. And I was like, yeah, well, you can't really see it. I mean, we've got to travel for a while. And I bought regionally and yeah. they all like really shut me down at that point. And I, and I walked away from it with so much less energy. And I thought they would ask me for advice or they'd be like, okay, cool. Like, mm. how did you do this? How did you do that? Instead, they were like, why would you buy there? We were brought, born and brought up in Sydney. You should have bought something in Sydney. Sydney yeah. grows and it's number one. Yes. And so I got shut down pretty quickly. And at that moment, I think it was a, a pivot from who I was starting to hang out with. Mm. And I started drifting away from that sort of, you know, group because they wanted to just watch footy and relax and whatnot. And I wanted to do those things, but I also wanted to have conversations where we can, you know, help each other up, like whether that's yeah. fitness, whether it's mindset, whether it's property and wealth. Yeah. Um, so I didn't have the right circle at that time. And that's why even now, like when we talk to people, I'm sure you talk to them as well, that they got the right mindset. But if you've got everyone else around you 90% of the time telling you not to do something, mm. it's going to make an influence. It's going to have an influence on how you think. It is. It, you're moving out of the, we're herd creatures, right? And so I've done a little bit of research around this. When you move out of the herd, it becomes socially ostracizing. Yep. And it's like, does Ravi think he's too good for us now? Yeah. Well, look at him, he's getting boot, yeah, too big for his boots. <laughs> and Mr. Property over here, uh, and it's not a, I'm better than them. It's just like, hey, look, I'm going a different path. And I, and you actually want them to come with you on the journey. Mm-hmm. Hey guys, come on, let's level up. And I think it's really hard at that stage because we're so, uh, what's the word? Um, we're so impressionable yep. in our twenties. We want to be, we want to fit in. We don't want to step outside the crew. Who, who are we going to find next, for example? But unfortunately it means you got to shift. You got to shift your peer group sometimes. And I tell you, it's a lot of young first home buyers or rent investors, for example, I'm like there are going to be people in your circle that are projecting their own insecurities on you. And that's probably what it is. As harsh as that sounds, all they're doing is they're not, they're not stopping you because it's, they're not paying your mortgage, mm-hmm. right? So they've got no say financially. They're projecting their own insecurities or their own fears onto you. And it, it comes out in a, in a certain manner that doesn't sound helpful. Mate, 100%. It's more to do with them than it is to do with you. Mm-hmm. And I think like that's the perfect pivot into like, being social, you know, with social media, it's like, I get a bunch of comments that aren't so great and <laughs> everyone gets them. Yeah. And you're sort of like at some, in the beginning, it affects you. And then after a while you realize you're like, I'm actually, it, it's less about me. It's more about you. Cause you got no context around what I'm saying here. Mm-hmm. You have no idea who I am as a person. And if you're taking 10 seconds of a video versus I've got like a hundred hours of content out there, you're not spending all that time to get to know what I'm actually all about. Mm. So you start switching off away from those things. And I think it's the same in real life mm. where you'll have people come into your life and tell you, this is how I would do it. This is how I would do it. But at the end of the day, you pay your mortgage, you live your own life. So it's very different, right? I got a, I got a no pay, no, no pay, no say policy. 
So if you're not paying my mortgage, you don't I really have to say what yes. I'm doing. Uh, and again, I mean, you said about you're going to get married soon. The same will go for the wedding. Everyone's going to have an opinion. You're like, dude, no pay, no say. You're not paying for the wedding. Unfortunately, you don't get, a, you don't get input into this thing. Yeah. You're going to do it our way. Um, so that's, uh, that's kind of one. You mentioned here about social media. And it's probably, I mean, you have leveraged this as a tool, as a platform, as a resource, for example, to get in front of more people. There's a way that it can be done extremely well. And I'll say congrats to you, mate. I think yeah, Thank you. Uh, you tread a very fine line between I'm providing information, but you're not making it about you. Mm -hmm. So it's not like stroking your ego in terms of how you've done it. And I think the off the back of that, you then look at, I think you look at your YouTube subscribers, you know, it's 60,000. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's good. It's bloody nuts, There's a mate. lot of nerds out there like it's real estate. <laughs> bloody nuts. We're not talking about makeup tutorials here. We're talking about <laughs> buying property. Um, I mean, that's... Do you feel is a change of the guard, for example, and say the buyer's agency world? Because, I mean, you've got buyer's agents that have been around for some time that have got tried and tested. They, they used to probably be in the magazines that you may have read in mm -hmm. your 20s uh, and they're going, hey, mate, this is a change in the old guard to the new guard. Do you feel that? Yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I guess it's made it possible for them to think outside the box now that, yeah. hey, there is an audience out there and, yes, I can use this to build my business. Um, I've seen, you know, all the people used to advertise on TV, then they moved to like other platforms. Yeah. And I think this is the same. Uh, mind you, like I had no intentions that it was going to become this big thing on its own and yeah. YouTube was going to be amazing. I thought, yeah, it was great to share my experiences and hopefully someone learns from it. Even if I have a thousand subscribers of the thousand, if a hundred become clients, I'm happy. Right. Mm. Uh, obviously it's grown into its own beast and that's where I want to keep feeding it because not everyone's going to use my service. Uh, I know people that have, you know, watched me for years and then they go and do it themselves or they go cool. and use someone else. Um, but I think it's but just had a knowing part to play in their journey. 100%. Well, yeah. Like I believe in the universe and putting out the right energy. And I think by me just putting out an extra video, you know, we've got a good feedback loop now where we know what, um, you know, sort of clients are coming from and whatnot. So I don't really need to put as much content and, you know, make it such a big priority, mm. but I choose to because if I can make an impact now with one video with, you know, like thousands of people yeah. versus how many could I actually do in their buyer's agency? It's a lot less. So yeah. just wear maximum impact. That's how I'm thinking about it. I love it. Are you comfortable with the word Finfluencer? <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think that's how I, I would get categorized, I suppose. Yeah. It's it's either that or I'm a, I'm a dirty buyer's agent from a real estate industry. Um, so, <laughs> you know, I cop it from both ways, but it is what it is. Yeah, I, mean, it's a, I, I like the idea of it, right, where uh, it's, a, it's an opt-in medium. People want to watch, people want to subscribe, people want to, you know, get access to your, to your IP and they'll opt in at some point and go, hey, look, I, I, I want to self-select and get, get my – info from you yep. or they're going to go somewhere else as well. So yep. it's kind of like you're not pushing them into it. You're going, hey, man, if you like what I'm putting out there, then tune in and kind of bolsters your bolsters your presence a bit as well. Yeah, I think social media in general, like if people love the mentality of trying to, you know, blame it things on other people. Uh, and I think Instagram's the same. Like people go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm sad because of Instagram. Mm -hmm. well, you don't have to be on there. Um, you choose to be on there yeah. and you opt to follow certain people. You opt to go on Friday night if you're not doing anything to look at other people, you know, at clubs or hotels. That's you actively taking that, you know, um, path. Mm -hmm. And this is the same with YouTube as well. It's like, you know, you walk into a room, there's a certain percentage of people that just don't like you and there's, there's nothing around it. They just don't like you. Mm -hmm. And so when you do that on social media, it's just walking into another room. I've just got 60,000 people that will, you know, look at me, but there's so many more that will, you know, come as tourists and visit and they go, I don't really like what he's saying, so I'll leave. Yeah. So it's all a, you know, personal choice. They can look at your LinkedIn post. They can go and look at your own podcast or listen to this podcast mm. and they don't like you, fine. You move on and you find someone yeah. that you do connect with. Yeah, well said. I like that. I like that. Um, going back, circling back to your portfolio and, and scaling up, when you look back on your journey, what worked that gave you that ability to kind of, Purchase, purchase, purchase. Because two things need to happen. You need to get equity, you need borrowing capacity. So mm -hmm. how does that happen in, uh, from a financial perspective? How did you choose the right assets that you go, hey, look, I can you know, leverage, re, re tap into the equity? Talk me through the scale of, scaling phase. Yeah. So there's always two things, right? It's the, you need the capital growth yeah. to get you the equity to, you know, offset the deposit yeah. um, or use as a deposit. And then you've got the cash flow to allow you to stay in the game. So yeah. the way I got taught early on, I'm not sure who taught me, uh, but it was, you know, Cash flow keeps you in the game and capital growth gets you out. 
right? Nice. So keeps you in the game to, you know, keep running around, building the portfolio, and then capital growth will ultimately get you to a point where you probably sell some of your portfolio, pay down all your debt if you choose to do that, and then you're out of the, the rat race or the game, mm. right? Um, so for me, I understood that very early on, which meant when I was working somewhere, I was always looking at side hustles. What can I do that, you know, doesn't eat into the time that I was doing full-time work? Right. So for a, an example, I was working full-time in conveyancing, but on the weekends I would promote at nightclubs. Yeah. So it was that sort of mentality that I knew every dollar at a multiplier of about five or six meant that I could borrow more. And so I thought if I can just use the research by the right property, the deposits will take care of themselves. Yeah. All I need to worry about is the game of the bank. And so if the bank is looking at 6% max yields and that's what they're going to borrow up against, I need the value to keep increasing because I know the rental growth will occur. Yeah. And so that just keeps me in the game for a lot longer. Right. Um, I think that was the only mindset that I had was those two things I focus on, everything else will work out. Mm. I mean, that's, again, maturity because people people aren't thinking that way. I mean, yeah. people that own some good incomes, good portfolios, and it's still like they're trying to do the, I'm going to need a $100 extra cash flow a week. I'm like, well, you're better than that. You put that money into your own career and you're going you're gonna to significantly increase your, your income uh, earnings as opposed to small cash flow as well. But mm -hmm. I guess you're tempering that growth going, we still need – the cash flow from the property, but the growth is where it's going to give you that stepping stone as well, right? Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, I think early on on YouTube, I created content around, oh, cash flow is king. You know, it's mm. great. Uh, and then people sort of go, oh, well, you only invest in cash flow, and I was like, no, you're missing the whole point. The right. cash flow is allowing you to stay in the game, and you're in the game to build wealth. So you, yeah. if you're in, well, you know, building wealth mode uh, accumulation, then you're going to need those, you know, increases in income and rental growth to keep you doing that. Yeah. And if that means you're taking 1% less in terms of capital growth, that'll sort itself out if you can build a strong enough base. Yeah. Um, but you definitely need both. Uh, along the way, were there lessons learned? I'm going to say not were there. There definitely would yeah, have been. Definitely. What were some of the lessons that were learned? Um, I think I almost fell for a couple of like schemes at the time, you know, um, looking at off the plan apartments. They yeah. looked so nice. And then, you know, what you actually looked into five years later, you're going, okay, I'm glad I didn't make that move. Yeah. But I know so many people that still make those mistakes. And as I was going through, I knew people that also did that. Yeah. And it's unfortunate because – that's just, you know, it's really good marketing, you know, um, for a, a lot of situations. They're like, okay, I know what my target market is and that's who I'm going to go for. Yeah. But sometimes you need to get burnt to understand, you know, well um, and and value what works. Because if everything worked, this would be easy. And you're like, oh, I, I wouldn't create a business yeah. off the back of this. But because I got burnt along the way, I'm like, if I'm making these mistakes, I'm sure someone else is too. Correct. And the ability, I think, again, it, it speaks to a lot of people's character when they go, I got burnt, but it's not going to stop me. Whereas some people get burned and like, that's it. I'm out for example. Like, come on, mate. Like that don't let that deter you because people have been through far worse and yeah. they've had to persevere and push through as well. I mean, you see how many people have built portfolios, had to lose it nearly all and then rebuilt it again. It's like, yeah. if you've done it once, you can do it again. Yeah. That's exactly the mentality I've got is, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, same with business, same with anything yeah. in life is things can go away like very quickly. It's life. Yes. Um, and if it does, then you've just got to have the right principles, the right mindset to go, okay, I can rebuild this. Mm -hmm. And as long as this is working, the rest will flow. Love it. Love it. So when you're talking to, I mean, you're probably getting all sorts of investors that are coming across you know, your your desk at the moment. What do you see the attributes of the really successful ones or the really aspirational ones or active buy, uh, you know, investors are versus the ones that are passive, dormant, for example, or unsure? Take me through. What do you, what do you feel their different attributes are? I think um, the main one at the moment, what I'm seeing a lot of is analysis paralysis, um, right. where they are trying to figure out the perfect property, the perfect market, because everything has lined up for this perfect moment. Mm. I can tell you now, it's never perfect. And the reality is, if the numbers look that good, you've probably already missed the boat. So that's how I look <laughs> at it, is you're going to be at 80% or 90%, and that's probably when you should be pulling the trigger, not when it's already confirmed. And so many people still to this day will look at, you know, these are the top 10 growing markets. So yeah. what, what do they do? They go on realestate.com. They're like, that's where I'm going to buy. Yeah. But the growth has already happened. Like the large part of it's happened. Now you're competing with a bunch of others who also read the same magazine. Mm. So I think the ones that are doing really well are willing to outsource the expertise. So whether that's, okay, I'm going to go to a broker to figure out what my finance looks like versus, hey, like I saw online that I could get a, you know, a, a better rate. Mm. I'm going to go with that bank. 
without knowing that they're going to do shading to their income. They're not going to be able to borrow as much and yeah. suddenly it doesn't serve their purpose. And I think the people that can align their thinking of going, my end goal is build wealth through real estate. And if I want to do that, it might mean I need to go to certain banks that have a higher rate, but they give me more capacity. Yeah. Same thing with borrowing for properties. Hey, I would love to get a property in this location, but it only gets me X, Y, and Z in terms of asset type. I need to go where I can get the best value and best return for what I'm trying to do long term. Mm. And that doesn't matter if it's in the inner west of Sydney or if it's in Perth or if it's in Queensland or if it's Tasmania. It's just understanding that you're working towards a goal. These are all little parts of your business, yeah. right? And it's too much of a focus on trying to get everything right you'll get something wrong. Mm. And, you know, if it's an air conditioner, how did you know it was going to break in three months? You yeah, wouldn't know that. Okay. okay. You mentioned end game there. Mm -hmm. What is, I mean, you're far too young to talk about end games. <laughs> there's always something where you go, hey, this is what I'm aspiring to or this is what I'm, I'm working towards as well. What what does that look like for you? I think um, the goalpost always changes, as you would know, right? <laughs> always. <laughs> always. Yeah. You get to like 30, it's like something else. And then you get to 35, 40, 45. I'm sure it's going to continue changing. And, I think it's a good sign because yeah. it means that you are a progressive. You're thinking about bigger things and yeah, different things. Yeah, you know, status quo. You're willing to keep Correct. pushing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think that's where we connect. Like once you're wired this way, you you just keep going. Um, mm. And so for me, it's not about having like a thousand properties or anything. It's very basic sort of stuff. So my first priority at the moment is okay. I built out this sort of base and wealth, and um, now it's sort of going okay. I want to I want to retire my mum, and then how do I help my brother? And nice. then once everyone immediate to me is taken care of, okay, cool. Now, how do I give back more into the community? Because I'm taken care of. Like your life doesn't really change too much if you're making 400 versus 600. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm thinking I'm 31. Yeah. Firstly, I don't need that sort of money anyway. Yeah. I don't wear fancy stuff. Yeah. Um, and then it's sort of going, okay, if I can bring as much happiness to the people around me, that means my mom's not going to be stressed out, which means when she comes and sees me, she's don't not know, stressed out. How much money your mom has, she'll always stress out. <laughs> Uh, that will never go away. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just, it's knowing that we're not having to just struggle for the dollar. And yeah. if I want to stay back and, you know, with my future kids and be able to go to school events, that's the position I want to be in. Mm -hmm. And I don't need the fancy stuff. I just want to be in that space. Yeah, nice. I guess, yeah, there's, there's, I think there's a lot of comfort in your own skin when you go, hey, look, I'm not chasing the material side, but hey, mate, there's, I think I've had someone else and they talked about, buy maybe a nice car. It's like, that was a deposit for another property. It's like, could I, could I do it? I'm like, nah, buy the property. Yeah. Like, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> delayed gratification, mate. I feel like that's, that's something that you, you picked up very early on in your life that I think even a lot of older, you know, fellow Australians could probably take a leaf out of your book and just go, look, bite the bullet. Imagine you planted the seed 20 something years ago. And mm. as a 40 something year old now, I'd and be the beneficiary of that as well. But there's probably another just last question is around asset classes. Mm -hmm. I've, again, I've, I've, I've tuned into your YouTube, so I've seen what you're, you're putting out there. Uh, the crypto shares, for example, how does that play a, a role in your portfolio? And then the next question to that is, what's your advice to younger Australians given that, you know, I have conversations with them and like, property's too risky, so I'm just going to put my money into crypto. I was like... <laughs> That's when I feel my age. Uh, so take me through them. Man, you forgot you forgot Pokemon cards because uh, you know. Oh, what are the other? I'm sure what about Reddit the threads what are the images? Around? What are those NFT? What's the oh, NFTs as well? NFTs, yeah, yeah. It's, um, yeah. Look, it's uh, it is a wild world out there. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. And I think there's always that um, you know shiny object. Uh, what, what's next? What's coming up next? And I can see how people fall for that trap. And I know I talk about crypto and I talk about NFTs and Pokemon cards. But I always say, like, I built my wealth in real estate for like eight years before I even spoke about this stuff, before mm. I even invested in this stuff. And the only reason I invest in it now is because I actually have a passion for these things. So while some people will sit there on the weekends and, you know, I don't know, look at car videos, I look at crypto content. I look at white papers of certain projects and what the, what are they trying to fix in the world or what are the solutions they're coming up with. And uh, in my downtime, instead of me spending time on watching Netflix, I like watching Pokemon investing videos. Like it's a bit weird and I get it, but I only focus on those things because I actually enjoy those things. Yeah. So for me, I think whether it's business, whether it's investing in asset classes, I think you've got to enjoy it to a certain extent because then you'll be 
you know, spending more time actually actively trying to understand the technology or understand what's actually happening and not just, oh, cool, you know, I heard someone bought Dogecoin or Bitcoin and mm. they made 10x. Let me go do that as well. Yeah. Um, I think the other part to it as well is if you build your wealth in real estate, so you build a machine, mm. if 90% of that machine, what the output looks like is reinvested into real estate, but 10% goes towards your passions or things that make you happier. Uh, in my case, I don't have interest in nice t-shirts with logos on them. I don't have interest in, you know, fancy cars or anything like that. So for me, I get pleasure out of going, how do I get nostalgia? How do I go and buy cards that I used to have as a kid? And I'll go and sit there and be like, one day I'm going to show my kids and that'll that'll serve some other purpose for me. Mm. Now, when it comes to the investing side, yes, Pokemon cards can do quite well, but no one's going to pick up a pack of cards and be like, yeah, that's what I'm going to invest in. Yeah. Um, and then when it comes to crypto, super risky because there's so much volatility. Mm. It's the same way that I look at, you know, tech companies 20 years ago, super volatile. And that's where all the gains were made as well. But so many people probably shouldn't invest in the first five years and then wait till things calm down. So you know what cream rises to the top. And those are the probably the ones that you, the Apples and the Microsofts of the world versus speculating on like Ask Jeeves or Yahoo mm -hmm. um, that probably haven't done so well long term. Yeah, nice, mate. Well said. Well said. Good head on your shoulders for that, mate. I think. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, the temptation is always for the shiny object, right? Like I can I can accelerate it before, but again, if we go back, I think towards the start about that parallel around health, like you've just got to make one decision. You've got to show up at the gym. You've got to get a good foundation. You get a good base. You're not deadlifting 100 kilos <laughs> when you first walk in, right? Same, yeah. with, same with wealth. You're not putting all your money on black. You're not putting all your money on crypto. You're going, put it into something that's bankable mm -hmm. and leverageable, which is property. Mm -hmm. Once you've got that little bit of, I don't know, play money there, for example, that you've built a, a small um, allocation for, then go off and and, and, and do your, your cryptos or your, or your and, and definitely into your shares and that, yep. that becomes a healthy, diversified portfolio. Then again, having all your eggs in one basket. But. Yeah, agreed, agreed. I think, um, you know, on the diversification point, yeah. I think the, the messaging has been sort of incorrect as well where you get taught, I'll diversify from the beginning. And so for me, I got taught that. So I had a bit of shares and, and yeah. I wanted to buy more property. And you're like, but if I can get on property and I do this for the next three years, I'll make more there. And then I can always come back into shares anyway. Correct. So I think for when you're in your twenties and thirties, right, there's so much going on, so much information. So I'm like, I get razor sharp on just one focus. Mm. And then from there, I can go and start dabbling into other things and then diversify because then you start protecting wealth. Yeah. And I think if you want to, the fastest way to grow it is go focus on one thing, be it your job, be it your, your business. And then I think you can start branching out going, okay, now I've got enough money to diversify, get 50%, 20%, 30%. Nice. I love it. Yeah. Really good, man. I love, I love having a chat. It's very easy. No, we just here, naturally mate. naturally uh, gravitate uh, towards a good conversation. Absolutely, here. I like mate. It. Um, I'm definitely going to get you back on and see how you know, see how 2024 is going to un un unfold for yourself, your team, personally, professionally. I'm excited to see what the future has in store for you, mate. So I want to say thank you very much for your time, your experience, your insights, mate. It's been a real pleasure. No, I appreciate it. Thank you man. so much for having me. And um, yeah, it's uh, it's a good connection to have. Awesome, mate. Thanks very much. If you want to get in, t uh, in touch with the team at Search Property, we'll include the details to your socials. Like I said. Can't miss you can't miss one on YouTube, which is a great thing as well because I met some of the YouTube videos I get are absolute garbage. <laughs> um, and uh, may I say that because all my kids are watching like wheels and stuff, mate. So that's <laughs> so not, a that, different not, purpose, that, mate. not that it's garbage. It's just like it's not it's not my algorithm anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've lost control of my algorithm, uh, <laughs> so I need a wheel back control. But hey, I want to say thanks very much if you've tuned in, you've loved uh, this episode. Please give us some feedback. Yeah, if it's a like, subscribe, fantastic. But if you've got questions, that's where the magic happens because that's where we can bring on guests because you're asking specific questions about, you know, what's going on inside their world as well. So that's a wrap. Until next time, take care.